Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. How are you all doing, everyone out there? Are you going a little bit crazy stuck in your homes yet? But rest assured, this is a doom and gloom free zone. On this Daily Tech Podcast, we're looking for solutions on finding a better way forward and how to hit the ground running when the upturn eventually kicks in. So yes, we're in a period of uncertainty at the moment, but if you're looking to leverage technology and explore new ways of doing things and unleashing innovation, then you're going to be in good company today. Because I think investing in technology can be a game changer when it comes to preparing for the future. And it can help you in uncertain times, like what's happening with the pandemic crisis at the moment. And the need for virtual solutions that are also very personal and customised has never been more apparent. And a lot of technological innovations, though, are focused on product and instrumentation innovation. But a company called Ulabo has many technological advances built into their equipment, such as safety alarms, remote communication with computers, data logging and privacy password management. And not only that, the company is currently exploring how to leverage IoT sensors, holographic displays, but they've also began implementing augmented reality and virtual reality technologies to reduce service wait times for their customers. And at the heart of all of that is Dirk Fraser, who found himself beginning to wonder if there were other technological applications that could be added to post-production to elevate the customer experience. But let me tell you, I'm just scratching the surface there because Dirk is an amazing guy. And I say that because he has put a huge beating heart at the centre of his tech company. But enough from me. I don't want to give you any spoilers before he comes on. So (laughs) buckle up and hold on tight. And I'll beam your ears all the way to Pennsylvania in the US. So you can join me and Dirk in conversation right now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Uh, Yes, my name is Dirk. I'm Dirk Fraser, and you might hear that from my accent. I'm uh, German um, by origin, and uh, right now I'm in Allentown, Pennsylvania in the USA. So where I'm coming from, yes, I was born in Berlin in Germany in the western part of the city in 1961, Um, and then fast forward, I became a biochemist. I did my PhD in biochemistry about aging and also Uh, I utilized quite a lot of viruses, which in today's time are really an interesting topic to talk about, but that's not the topic of what we are going to talk about here. So then being a biochemist after a while, I changed careers because I was founding a family and uh, was looking for more sustainable funding, And uh, to be very honest, and so I went into industry and at first into the pharmaceutical area where I started a career in sales and marketing and from the pharmaceutical arena into the laboratory market and uh, started then to work in Switzerland. And um, after that, I never got rid of the laboratory market in a certain way. I, I moved then to other companies in that arena. And from Switzerland, I took then responsibility marketing wise for Central Europe, uh, later uh, on a global basis for all of analytical instrumentation with a company called Thermo Fisher Scientific. And from uh, there on, um, and still working from Switzerland, by the way, and from there on, uh, then I went finally to a company called Ulabo, that's J-U-L-A-B-O, which I'm currently working at. That's a German company uh, doing temperature control and still in the laboratory field. And they are originally based out of Germany, but they have a U.S. subsidiary, and this is the company I'm working for here uh, for the last six years, and that made it possible for me to move then from Switzerland to the U.S., because that was honestly, uh, and that's a personal note, uh, but a dream of mine to once work in the U.S. and live in the U.S., because when I was working uh, from Switzerland uh, with a global responsibility that was really tough because the main markets were in the U.S. already at the time, and I had to travel quite a bit. 
and born in the western part of Berlin in the American sector in 1961 when the wall was erected meant that you had been raised very pro-American at the time and I was always looking forward to once be here and and now this dream came true and I know it's not a dream for a lot of people today sometimes uh, but for me it was really uh, fulfilling what I was always longing for and it's a great great pleasure so I really enjoy working for this uh, temperature control company temperature control not in the sense of HVAC uh, or air conditioning um, but in the sense of uh, for the laboratory to produce in the pharmaceutical arena or biotech uh, arena um, various drugs and vaccines and these kind of likes but also in other industries like space tech and electric car vehicles uh, there's a lot of temperature control needed something that I didn't even know before it's exciting it's every day something new and um, yeah I'm enjoying it wow you've been on an incredible journey and there's so many so many reasons I'm excited to get you on the podcast today because I think a lot of technological innovations are focused on product and instrumentation innovation. But you have a deep passion for technology and how it can actually be used to drive customer engagement and experiences. But before we dive into all that, I'll take you back to the moment where you began to wonder if there were other technological applications that could be added to post production to elevate the customer experience. Because I think that is the magic moment, isn't it? Yes. So, uh, first of all, I'm personally interested in, in technology in general. I was always fascinated. Uh, by that already as a as a young boy and uh, have seen all the developments coming and and uh, moving us forward so it was natural for me then to think how can I implement that in my daily life private life on the one hand uh, but of course also in my professional life because that really makes up most of the time and, and the passion I'm uh, I'm here for on a daily basis so then working for this company Yulabo uh, I've seen that our products are great, uh, great quality, and of course there are other companies out there um, with similar features and benefits, and I wouldn't downplay their quality. And uh, so you have always to look how do you differentiate yourselves from the others to be more successful. And that was what I wanted to achieve. I wanted to achieve uh, growth for the company, and uh, honestly, we achieved tremendous growth uh, in these last six years. Um, and that was only possible by differentiating ourselves from the others. There are two ways of doing that. Uh, you mentioned customer experience. Customer experience has to be and had to be elevated by uh, better customer service. So by, by the human element, you could say. Uh, that was one thing I achieved by really optimizing the team and the team spirit and uh, communication training, uh, which is something I'm very fond of. And on the other hand, you can uh, look into the product. How is the customer experience different if the product changes? And um, me distributing products which are produced by uh, the headquarters, so to say, in the German uh, Black Forest area, uh, the influence is small because um, you are considered like a distributor of these products and you can give input what the customers and the market needs. Um, but this is typical for each and every industry uh, that yeah, you can give input, but it takes a while and, until things really uh, change. So what can I do more quickly? Because the results that we are looking for, of course, have to come in more quickly. So I have then to change, as you say, the customer experience and I have to add technology which uh, isn't there and isn't uh, with the other competitors. So at first, I started pretty easy uh, using the technology of the, of the mobile phones, thinking uh, we have um, tools like FaceTime or Google Duo and, and these kind of things that you're using today even much more than six years ago, and say, okay, instead of sending a service tech or an account manager to install a unit on site at the customer's site, if the customer doesn't want to pay for it to make it more attractive on the one hand or to make it easier in scheduling and in today's times even talking about the carbon footprint which would be less we could do this virtually i call this v delivery for virtual delivery so unpack with the customer the unit and start it up um, because everybody knows, and I don't know how you are, Neil, but, but I hate manuals, honestly, so do a lot of customers <laughs> of ours. So I, I wrap the box usually open, whether it's a guitar or whatever, and then I start using it. Um, so, so do our customers as well. So they appreciate a life help 
instead of reading through 100 pages of, of a detailed manual. And that's something we offered and we were the first at the time. So this, with V-Delivery and virtual being already part of the name, that described our journey going forward to become more virtual and augmented reality driven uh, than any, any other company in this area. And, and I'm very, very proud about that. And I'm sure you're uh, asking me about then the next steps. But, but V-Delivery really was the starting point. And that set us apart. And I think that is what's going to be so valuable to business leaders and decision leaders listening that want to understand how they should be leveraging technology because you applied technology to enhance your business when you first started offering V delivery about five years ago. But can you expand on those next steps and how you did it just for to help other business leaders listening? Yeah. So then what, what else could we do? And, um, and there were a few uh, minor things and, and some bigger uh, steps. So uh, the one that we are currently really focusing a lot around uh, is the augmented reality. And, and I think it's, it's exciting uh, not only to have this connection, as I was talking about, this face timing with the customer, but you take it to the next level. What's the difference if you have um, people wearing smart glasses in the location and, and seeing into the unit and then having remotely here at the headquarters expert technicians understanding what's going on in the unit if this less experienced service tech out there in the field uh, doesn't know. And then in addition to just this FaceTime kind of uh, relation, we can then also send wiring diagrams into these glasses. We can mirror them into the display of the person working on the unit. Uh, We can uh, analyze parts and uh, show SKUs, uh, uh, part numbers, uh, what is necessary, and and all these kind of things. Interestingly enough, with these modern smart glasses, the resolution and also the resolution on the screens sometimes gives you a better view here at the headquarters than the service tech has in the field. It sounds unbelievable that the human eye's resolution can be less than what you have with technology today. But that, of course, is another advantage, which is something we never thought about. So this is what we implemented. And um, we call this Luca Vision. And, and the reason why we call it Luca Vision is we wanted to brand it because I'm a marketing guy. And uh, it's not only for the customers to use it as a brand, it's for us internally as well, because the biggest challenge, and that holds true for every technology that we are talking about right now, the biggest challenge really is to get buy-in from your own employees, because it's always change, and nobody really likes change. We are all conservative organisms, more or less. And uh, I, I'm curious, I always want to see something new, but, but when you implement something, it always gives race to resistance and change management is one of the most difficult tasks for a leader and therefore if you then a new technology brand to use it inside to give it a name that people can identify with it that it becomes kind of a human face um, which is attached to it that makes it much easier that's the reason why we call it luca vision luca by the way is a mascot which exists with ulava usa for 20 years already it's a frog which we adapted and we thought it's so, it's so good to use it uh, as, a, as a mascot for Luca Vision for the augmented reality here because a, a frog has 360 degree vision. So we thought that, that sounds good. Um, so that really helped. That's how it all started. And I can also go a little bit into how I came about this, if you are interested in that, Neil, because that's a personal story. Beginning of last year, in February 2019, uh, I was invited by Porsche North America, the sports car manufacturer, and they had uh, just implemented the technology as a first car manufacturer like that. So when they had dealers which had issues with cars that they couldn't repair in time, um, then these people wear the smart glasses and an expert in Atlanta in the North American headquarter uh, could analyze and help and really have a much better resolution time of the issues. So the downtime really uh, was decreased by 40%. In fact, they're in the meantime talking even about 60%. And that's something that's interesting for us as well, because our customers cannot afford downtime. If the units, the chillers or the heaters do not work, that means either research 
or even production has to stop. So I was intrigued by this presentation and I thought this is not only valid for cars and this is something that I could really adopt. And so I started to work with the same software provider, which is Athea, A-T-H-W-E-R. In the meantime, they are also spreading this throughout the whole uh, company between Porsche, Volkswagen and Audi and also in the UK where you are located, they're using the same technology, but nobody uses it in the lab. And we are the only ones, the first ones, and I'm excited to spearhead this development in the laboratory market. And we are excited, our customers are excited, and I think that gives another thrust to the growth that we are seeing currently. It's fascinating. It really is the journey you've been on and the tremendous success that you've experienced. And before you came on the podcast today, I did do a little bit of research on you. And I also learned that you began implementing uh, augmented reality and virtual reality technologies to reduce service wait times for customers. But again, I don't know why I'm surprised here, but there's another great story behind that. So can you tell the listeners a little bit more about the inspiration behind LucaVision and also where that name came from? So Luca uh, was the name of, of our mascot of the frog because uh, we had this frog for a long time and in the U.S. specifically. That's something I, I never learned in Europe. So when I came here, I was honestly wondering, what, we as a company have a mascot? But then going to these sports events with baseball, football, and you name it, I realized pretty soon that each and every uh, team has a mascot. So that was something which was adapted here for the company as well, uh, to have a frog. And um, the frog makes sense not only because of Luca Vision, as I said before, as a frog has 360 degree vision. A frog makes sense for us as a temperature control company because frogs being amphibians, they have various body temperature based on the environment so they can change body temper temperature, not like us humans. So that makes sense because we change a lot of temperature in a very precise way on the one hand. And on the other hand, I love the frog because as a business person, um, there is something to the frog as a symbol as well, which is exciting because a frog, I don't know whether you ever thought about that, is only leaping forward. I never thought about that myself. It can never go backwards. And that's something exactly what I want this company to do. And uh, then we were looking for a name because it was nice to have this little frog that we gave away at trade shows and uh, little rubber frogs for, for the bathtub and so on. People loved it but it doesn't, didn't have a name. So we thought about, we have to have a gender neutral name that, and Luca is one of these that you can apply to female as well as male uh, persons or frogs in this case. And that's why we branded it. And as I said before, this helps in identifying with the product, not only for the customers, but, but specifically for the employees. And when we are talking about service, reducing service time, uh, yes, we, we are much quicker, first of all, because we don't have to travel to places so often. So that makes it easier. There's no on-site um, uh, service tech then necessary, which reduces travel time. It reduces the carbon footprint, but you can be extremely quick because you can schedule uh, an augmented reality call very, very quickly. And we have also uh, service partners appointed because the US is such a large geography that we on our own can hardly travel to all these places. So we have service partners on the West Coast in Los Angeles, and we have service partners up in Canada, which is even a larger geography. And um, to connect with these is much more difficult and to get them up to speed with our product because they are servicing other products as well from other companies and other industries. So therefore to equip them with the smart glasses and use Luca Vision in connection with these, that had a profound impact. And uh, if we are talking about Canada specifically, augmented reality helps specifically because there's a border in between. And this border is more tight than you might think. If you want to send people working there, it becomes a real nightmare. You cannot just send a service tech up there if a customer of yours is down. And so therefore, um, to avoid these kind of problems, um, augmented reality really helps uh, to overcome legal restrictions and, and to make things 
even from this point of view, easier. Something that initially I didn't think about. And in Canada, we had also another use case that we did not have a service case, but an installation case. So we sent a unit, wanted to get it installed. It was a complex installation. And therefore, we could utilize uh, Luca Vision in this case as well. And I see a lot, a lot more use cases for this technology, even outside of service in sales and marketing as well. And we are talking a lot about LucaVision and AR and VR technologies, but just for people listening again, could you help them understand how it would work in their world by maybe sharing a use case? So, yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking also a lot of certain conferences and panels and yeah. uh, about AR and VR, and I hear a lot about other use cases uh, which are exciting because I think, first of all, for us, it's about better service to the customer, less downtime, being quicker. That's easy to be understood. But I think there are also other exciting cases out there for AR, augmented reality. Um, when you have a, a working environment, which is a hazardous environment, whether it's high voltage to work on these power grids and power lines, that's where augmented reality is used a lot because you can work hands free. You see in your monitor, which is in front of your eye or your eyes, depending on the glasses you use, you see all the details and uh, what uh, the headquarter is sending to you remotely as information, what to do, where to do what. Um, so education and training becomes much easier. And even in a, in a hazardous environment, this makes work so much safer because you have both hands free. That's important. Whereas compared to FaceTime, having your phone in the hand, that, that is different. And this is one of the use cases. Another use case, of course, which is in a hazardous environment, is working in a nuclear power plant. Also there, uh, augmented reality is used a lot right now, even on a global basis. These are the industries where these uh, started uh, out the most and the most rapid, in the most rapid fashion. And you don't need a lot of training and education. So therefore, uh, freight forwarders use this to inspect products when they are coming in at an airport. Uh, the IATA uh, organization for the International Airline Transportation Organization, they use AR from the same service provider. And, and, and all these large um, uh, parcel services as well, because you, you can really inspect things so much quicker and you have always then somebody being able remotely to control and check and help. And, and there are, I think, endless, endless use cases. And when I'm talking about uh, sales and marketing, I think that's the future as well. Instead of sending people to do a sales call, you can also do that much more remotely in a much better fashion uh, than just by a video conference. So you get more senses involved. And then the next development, which we haven't entered yet, but I was very interested in as well, is virtual reality, of course, because then you immerse the person really into a virtual environment and can have a sales call or a marketing event as if it would be real. And just in today's time that we are in right now, and um, depending on when you are listening to this podcast, hopefully things might have been forgotten already, but we are in the crisis of coronavirus right now. I think... Um, these technologies will definitely will, will be propelled forward at a pace that we could never even imagine because it was always about, do I implement these technologies? Is it just a cool gadget? Does it really bring me something? I think we see a lot of benefits and there was always the hesitance about investment and cost. But in these times where we practice social distancing and have to do this, um, there is no doubt that, uh, we have to use technologies like that. You will see a huge acceleration of, of use cases now in the coming weeks and months. And like I say, we've talked about AR and VR, but that's not it. We're just scratching the surface there because I believe that you guys are also looking into IoT sensors that can be added to machines post-production to actually help track a equipment, performance, service, and maintenance needs. So can you tell me a little bit more about what excites you about that tech and how transformative it actually is? Yeah, we are also there at the, at the very first uh, baby steps, so to say. So it's very early uh, in the process. I'm interested in implementing that. We haven't done this yet, to be very open and, and honest about that, because we are just 
looking into this. But uh, what that means, Internet of Things, is that each and every instrument is connected directly to the Internet via a cloud service usually, and then uh, the data are transferred uh, to another place, usually the manufacturer, which then can analyze these data, can see anomalies, and then have the ability to predict a certain failure or a service case to come up and then give you as the user the information, oh, here's a red flag, you might want to look into that, you might want to change this gasket, or you might want to change the oil here or there, something which also has to be done to our units as well. Uh, because. Uh, in the days of what's called this Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolu revolution where everything is digital and mobile and cloud-based, we have now the ability to process so many data, which 10 years ago we couldn't, that we could predict situations uh, before they are even happening. And uh, in the past it was always, oh, my unit is failing, um, my car is stopping on the road, uh, I have to call the roadside assistance. We don't want to do that. We want to be ahead. We want to... We want to maintain the unit or the car or whatever it is before this event happens. And uh, we have the opportunities to do that. And with the Internet of Things, uh, what that means is you put into the instrument many sensors, as many as needed, and that's what our engineers and service techs are telling us, and then collect these data in real time and have the computer processing them and really showing in a dashboard what's going on in the unit. And also the user can do that, of course, if they are interested in doing so and have the time to look into that all the time and then see what is going to happen. Um, we are uh, selling uh, industrial chillers uh, in addition to the ones that uh, are from Yulabu. That's a different kind of necessity to bundle these up with some of our units sometimes if our customers don't have the quality of cooling water. And these industrial chillers already have these sensors in there, and you can check on your smartphone what they are doing. And that's definitely something I would like to implement here as well. Uh, that's also something that manufacturers can do, but this is something that post-production can be done. And it even makes sense because you connect then your unit, like you can do that with your refrigerator at home today. There are a lot of fridges who are able to do that. You connect them via the Internet through uh, a mobile phone uh, connection and therefore it is very often very regional and country specific what you should use and what you could use and right now these large uh, telecom providers are entering the field from their end so they are offering services uh, to you as a manufacturer or a sales organization like ours uh, to implement their sensors into your units. That's something I didn't know before because I was just going to my local telecom store and uh, bought my smartphone and, and my contract. I didn't know that these guys in the meantime really uh, focus a lot uh, on this kind of technology and help companies connecting their instruments to the mobile uh, network. And of course, it's for them to profit as well because uh, we have a few million people uh, using smartphones, but you have billions of, of units, instruments, you name it, from the fridge to the, I, I don't even know, from the electrocardiograph or whatever it is that you use. Uh, that's a, a, lot, a much bigger market for these guys. Therefore, they are helping us. And yeah, as I said, we are, on the, we are doing baby steps right now, but, but that's something I'm really excited because that would make the work and the application for the customer so much smoother and more predictable. And you do seem to have a lot of self-awareness as well and just observing trends around you because I read that you're also doing some great work with holographic displays. And I believe that that originated after growing increasingly concerned about the amount of money being spent on shipping incredibly expensive equipment to and from trade shows all across the US and beyond. But can you, can you share that story with the listeners today as well? Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is twofold why I'm so uh, interested in that because trade shows, uh, that's a general topic. As now you're talking to the marketing dirt here. Uh, <laughs> trade shows in general have seen a huge downsizing uh, trend over the last 10 years, I would say. So I recall times when, when trade shows were packed and that you could hardly walk the aisles. Uh, this definitely uh, changed. And, um, and 
Europe is interesting in this regard because they still tend to have trade shows which are successful, uh, but in other areas uh, that really is, is not the case anymore. So you have to stand out from the crowd. So that's one opportunity uh, to do something different here. The other thing is when I was looking into uh, the return on invest on trade shows, I've seen where's the cost coming from. It's the booth design, it's travel of our employee and hotel cost accommodation, everything like that. And then there was this huge cost, and still is, uh, for sending units around. And you're right, they are large, they are, they are heavy, and it costs thousands of dollars to send these units from trade show to trade show. So I was thinking, is that really, uh, in light of today's um, world, the right thing to do? And also from the env environmental aspect, of course. And... Um, then we were thinking, what can we do? I thought, if we want to be the tech leader and, and implement technology like we were talking about, we should also reflect that in our trade show appearance at the trade shows that we go to. So we were thinking about various things, and I was always interested in holographic displays. And, um, and, and that goes back a, a long time ago, because the first ideas of holographic projections, I think you've seen that in Star Trek already at these sci-fi movies, and, and that's what I grew up with. So I thought, isn't that the future? And, and I was looking into this more and more, and I didn't know how to make it palatable and affordable for us uh, to just project the units that we are going to sell. And I thought, on the other hand, what, do, what is the value to put a real chiller onto a trade show floor? What does the customer really get out of it? It's all about the human interaction. I have to attract the person to come to the booth and then start to talk to them, to communicate to them, to get them interested, and then eventually to sell a product. But just to, to have this unit sitting there, I thought that's not attractive enough. So a holographic display would be something that, that would be very cool. But as I said, there was no technology around which made it palatable for us. And... Um, Luckily, um, we were talking a lot internally about that, also with the marketing agency that we are working with, 11 Cents Digital, and um, they knew about my, my idea, and then they came back and said, there is a technology out there, and interestingly enough, from the UK, where you are located, and, um, and that's called Hypervision. And what they do, they have a technology which mimics somehow a holographic display. It's, it's not the real thing. It's similar, but it gives the impression. So for the human eye, it looks like a hologram. Uh, it's uh, made possible by a very quickly spinning fan with LED lights on it, which are then controlled by a computer. And um, light flashes then really simulate an image which is then turning, and then you can really see the whole thing. You can even uh, show other graphics, not only the unit. You can tell a real story, and this is really very exciting. Uh, before we bought into this, um, we checked it out because in the U.S., somebody else was using this technology that was this magician, Chris Angel, in Las Vegas. Same units, and um, to show levitating people. So I thought, hmm, um, if that is around, I would, I would like to see that before I buy into this. And luckily, my wife at the time was in Vegas giving a talk, a keynote uh, lecture on something different. And I sent her at night there. I said, you have to go there. And she didn't want to because she doesn't like magicians. And, and she came back and called me at night. And she said, that was mind-blowing. So I said, okay. Um, I signed the check, <laughs> we go for it, and uh, not having seen it myself, because that wasn't possible at the time. And we were impressed. We had a, a huge show in November 2019, where we have shown it the first time. Um, that was a cannabis-related show in Las Vegas, and um, people were amazed so much that they wanted to buy our booth. They wanted to buy the technology. They said, no, 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 you should buy our product. But they were so blown away by the impression. Um, and that's exactly what we wanted to achieve. And it reduces cost, it makes it more exciting. It shows that we are really a tech leader, uh, which I wanted to really bring across. And again, the carbon footprint is less. I think something we definitely uh, should uh, take into consideration in today's time. 
And I think many people listening might be thinking that all this sounds incredibly cool and how you're working with and leveraging all these emerging technologies, but they could think you need to be a large enterprise to have that luxury of using technology to stand out from the crowd. But I know you think this is not true at all. So can you tell me a little bit more about why you believe that inspiration for innovation is actually everywhere and everyone can actually look at existing technologies and think about how to use them in different ways. Because I think, especially as we're going through this global pandemic at the moment, I think innovation has never been more important. Uh, I think innovation was always important, uh, is always important. And you're right in today's time, of course, under this enormous pressure that we are in, uh, of course, uh, things might uh, develop even quicker than, than usual. That's, that's true. And, and you're right, usually, uh, new technologies uh, which tend to be expensive are um, implemented by larger companies first uh, before they come available for smaller companies but uh, there's a huge difference between large companies and small ones and uh, that is the organization so in a large company and i worked for a lot of large companies with 50,000 employees and more um, you have these processes in place uh, before something is approved and even if somebody has an idea until it gets to the place where it can be approved, it takes a long time usually. And very often this idea dies before it gets the signature to be approved. Here, small is an advantage. Large is not always better. Sometimes smaller is better, like we have seen in evolution. Uh, there are no dinosaurs around anymore, but a lot of mice. So that should tell us something. So um, we also are small but mighty if it comes to this, because we are so small that we are a family-owned company, and if I have an idea and can show um, in a presentation or a phone call or whatever why I think that makes sense and why we should uh, do this and be successful with this, uh, I get approval right away. So in this case, smaller is better because then the owner and shareholder says, yes, of course, Dirk, do it, go ahead, because we have seen over the past that these new ideas, whether it's V-Delivery or Luca Vision, really helped. And... Um, then the question only is how to make it affordable. And here, of course, curiosity helps uh, to look around. As I said, we, we came then across this hypervision company in the UK, uh, whereas if we would have looked for the real holographic display technology, which is also starting to emerge, then you are talking about investments of $100,000, $150,000 uh, for a trade show booth. That's nothing that I could or the company could afford. But when you look for other opportunities, of other people who have great ideas uh, and adopt these, then you make this reasonable and affordable. And we are talking here just a few thousand dollars um, per projector that you need or so. That, that is really something that makes a lot of sense because you save this already at the first trade show just in transportation costs. So you have to be curious, you have to keep your eyes open. And here it might help that I'm a scientist perhaps because Curiosity is our main trait. Uh, and then you have to, to have great people and a great team, like I said, also with this marketing agency, as well as inside our company, who understand what your vision is, in this case mine, and then they, they are looking out for you and, and bring back the information that you need, and then it becomes affordable, and then we can be the first, which for me is always very important. I don't want to be lagging behind others. I want to really show where the trends go and uh, this image then translates to the products and the services and it really uh, turns into sales that's for me the key thing and like i said a few moments ago we are in this period of uncertainty at the moment but recessions can be a great catalyst for innovation so i'd love to end on a happy note i mean do you have any advice for businesses on how they can leverage these emerging technologies and get creative in applying them to their business or their industry because it, it is available to everyone isn't it yes uh, it is really available to everyone you have really to look uh, where you can get what and uh, and as we are a uh, global uh, right now and we seriously are global, not only the virus uh, spreads on a global basis, uh, we also have access uh, globally to a lot of information and we could utilize that uh, to fight back, uh, to fight back against the virus uh, on the one hand, but also uh, to use these kind of um, developments. And um, 
that that's something which is possible. So last night I was on the phone with with China to source the product, and uh, this is uh, today possible, and therefore it's it's affordable. Uh, because of that, which in the past you were really only looking around in, in your vicinity or your country, and that made it very difficult. And um, we have really to put all our efforts together in crisis like that, and that's something that people are much more open then to do than in normal circumstances. And just this attitude, this mental attitude and open-mindedness uh, helps a lot. And in these difficult times, um, Yes, a lot of companies are struggling because they have to close down. They, uh, we are in the lockdown in certain areas and, and countries. It makes it very difficult to do business. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of investment uh, and, and money spent uh, to fight a crisis. So uh, you have to be quick and rapid, of course, to look uh, where this happens in which part of your industry, in which segment of the industries that you are serving. And... Um, and they have a need, they have a demand, and they are uh, deciding quickly. So if you are then talking to these guys, in this case, as of today's crisis, it might be different in, in tomorrow's crisis, but in today's situation, of course, it's pharma and biotech um, that are very willing to invest in new technology and, and adopt um, what is out there to really develop drugs, vaccines, whatever it takes, as quickly as possible. And, and they get the funding for this. And, and this is something that uh, yeah, we, we definitely see and follow, for sure. And for anybody listening that would just like to find out more information about you, your company, your story, or anything at all, can you just point them in the direction of where they can find you guys online? And equally, what's the best way of reaching your team if they just have any additional questions after listening to our conversation today? Uh, so yes, how can you find us as a company online? You can find us, of course, in all the usual channels. But let me start with the, start with the website first. So our website is uh, www.ulabo. That's J U L A B O. dot U S. That's important. The ending U S in this case. Uh, we got a very pretty nice new website up there, which you might enjoy. Uh, you find all the information up there, blogs, white papers, whatever it is that you might be interested in. Uh, we also have a very exciting app. And again, that's something we developed. And again, we are the first in our industry, in our segment, uh, to use an app. Um, so that's called the ulabo.us app. You get it on all these usual uh, app stores for the various smartphones that you might have. And of course, we are on all these social media from LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram. And it's also interesting to see the different trends on these social media. Various uh, segments of the industries we serve use very different uh, social media channels. So we have to address, address each and every one of them with very different content. That's also something we learned in marketing. And me personally, uh, you can find on LinkedIn under just my name, Dirk, D I R K, and last name, Fraser. F-R-E-S-E. -E. I'm very happy to connect with you and uh, to chat with you. Uh, you can also then call me, whatever it takes. I'm always available and, and uh, looking forward to talking to each and every interested party because, as I said, I'm very curious. I always learn everything each day uh, from each and every conversation, which I'm then probably applying into future technology for the company. Excellent. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast today. Something that I always say at the end of every episode is technology works best when it brings people together. And listening to your story there, yes, we've got emerging technologies, exciting tech such as augmented reality, virtual reality, holographic tech, but at the heart of everything in your company are some incredible human stories. And I love how also how you learn from every single person you meet. So it's like, perfect mix for me of high tech and a very human approach and that big heart that you lead with so a big thank you Dirk for coming on and sharing that with me today thank you very much Neil I really enjoyed talking to you it, it was a great pleasure for me as well and uh, I always enjoy sharing our story here and our success stories as well as how we uh, implement new technology this is really you just mentioned the heart this is really very close to my heart and uh to connect through technology with other people because it's always about the human beings.
that I'm interested in the most. And this really is just a vehicle to make this better, even in times of social distancing. Uh, technology is the only way of keeping in touch and, and uh, get the conversations going. And uh, this podcast is part of it. So thank you. I cannot thank you enough. And what I love most about today's guest is every element of the technology used by the company has a very rich human story behind it. For example, they named the technology LucaVision after their company mascot, Luca the Frog. Why? Because frogs can see in many directions, nearly 360 degrees. And that's something that I've learned from today's show. And I also learned that frogs can't hop backwards. They can only move forwards. But there were so many other stories too. How Dirk saw that technology when he was attending a local Porsche club event. And straight away, the light bulb switched on for Dirk as he began to wonder how he could use that too. And the great work with holographic displays was the result of growing increasingly concerned about the amount of money that was being spent on shipping equipment to and from different trade shows. So if I put all that into a big melting pot and say to myself and ask myself, what did I learn from Dirk today? I think it's that we should always think of your customers and their needs. Think of your internal pain points and begin to then apply technology accordingly. And it's just simple questions. Can you reduce service wait times? Can you save money by not shipping equipment? These are the kind of questions that lead us to innovations. And of course, that will also help you stay up to date as best you can with emerging technologies and get creative with applying them, no matter what business or what industry you're in, or indeed the size of your business. But over to you, please share your thoughts on today's conversation. And please remember to keep those questions coming over too. I'm the easiest guy in the world to find. Simply send me a quick email, techblogwriteroutlook.com or tweet me at Neil C. Hughes. And if you'd like to browse through over 1,200 other podcast interviews, you can find me on my website, techblogwriter.co.uk. But I'm afraid we've reached the end of another episode. But before you get too downhearted, don't. I'm going to be here again tomorrow. I've got another guest lined up, ready to go for you all. And we'll explore how technology is transforming another business, industry, or indeed life. So I hope you'll join me again tomorrow. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.